Uh, my name's Alec Peach, I'm editor of Network Magazine, and I'm here with uh, Peter Jones, who's the technical manager of the Energy Research Partnership. Uh, Peter, do you want to um, tell us a bit more about what the uh, Energy Research Partnership do to start with? Yeah, the Energy Research Partnership is a public-private uh, partnership that uh, guides and accelerates in, uh, innovation in the energy sector, um, made up of uh, government, industry and academia. Great, and obviously uh, this year the uh, theme for Utility Week Live uh, has been uh, disruption. Um, so we're, we've um, you know, been looking at various, various bits and pieces, trying to shine a light on what some of the disruptive technologies are, and obviously a lot of the content over the two days will be focused on that. But we're actually looking ahead, as you know, you're part of our advisory board for our Utility of the Future campaign, and that will be uh, a key focus for us at uh, next year's event. Um, wondered first of all um, if you wanted to sort of say what your view of the utility of the future or the network of the future might look like. Yeah, I think there's uh, there's radical changes. I think Alec on, on the way. I think the utility of the future will be very much different than it is now. One of the things that uh, we've picked up in the Energy Research Partnership and in the Energy Systems Catapult is the multi-vector aspect of utilities. At the moment, utilities is very vertical, it's gas, it's electricity, it's telecoms, potentially heat. The utility of the future will be much more combined and coordinated and potentially more focused locally rather than a single entity at a national level or a very large regional level. So I think the utilities will be very much different in the future than they are now. So what sort of changes do you think we might see in the next say 10 to 20 years? Well, it's, 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 really, it's really difficult to, uh, to change utilities that have been established and done very good jobs for 20, 30, 40 years. So I think the core utilities may change slowly, but I think in the next 10 to 20 years, I think you could say the, 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 the upstarts, the, the radical, the new, the ubers, uh, of the utility uh, sphere will emerge and gain traction very rapidly with new and innovative approaches expanding on what the existing utility infrastructure has and I think the existing utility infrastructure in the next 10 years will gradually then be pulled along by the radical nature of some of the new utility models that will, that will appear. So with that in mind, then there's likely to be a lot of opportunities for sort of, as you say, new business models, um, systems, etc., innovation. Yeah, I think one of the things that will come out of this, again, it's no criticism of the existing utilities that are a very good job, is because there's possibly a focus on more local, a focus on more multi-vector, a focus more on customer services rather than the provision just of one particular energy uh, service, it, it, it will provide through things like digitalization uh, a, a great deal of opportunity for new, completely new business models. So packaging of um, gas, electricity, possibly even some degrees of transport, heating as a service, tailored more to the locality rather than necessarily national. And this potentially offers the advantage of more attractive services to customers, which will then stimulate investment and further stimulate innovation. So there's plenty of opportunity. It will be pulled rather than pushed on the basis that there are so many potential benefits that customers will demand, and therefore the business models and the innovation will follow very rapidly. And in, and in particular in the network space, um, I think we, we've both uh, come across that there seems to be a lot more opportunities now for SMEs, uh, for example. Yeah. Um, in terms of uh, you know some of the new business models and uh, uh, the new opportunities for them to work with networks. Uh, how important is that in terms of driving the innovation forward? One of the things that's going to be absolutely essential for the future is going to be flexibility and speed of operation and agility and those sort of aspects uh, and particularly around software systems. Spade falls from SMEs. SMEs will have that new approach, that freshness, and they'll probably bring forward the innovative side, particularly on the software. So I think there's plenty of opportunity for SMEs to bring into existing utilities, but also particularly into the new utilities, the new, more flexible, service provision based, new service provision based utilities. And I think that, as I say, the main utilities will also benefit from working with SMEs 
on that flexible basis. And as part of our uh, Utility of the Future campaign, which will be um, a series of content, uh, campaigns and hopefully some events uh, leading into, before we go into next year's Utility Week Live, the first pillar that we're focusing on is, um, is cli uh, the climate change. And obviously with the Committee on Climate Change uh, recently putting out a report uh, around the uh, net zero uh, targets, um, what impact can utilities have, uh, do you think, uh, on achieving that? Well, I think utilities in any shape or form in the future are going to have a critical impact on the speed at which we address the climate change issue. If, if the flexibility isn't there, if the innovation and the, the new business models that we talked about to allow this quick and agile take of things like hydrogen potentially, then you know they will play a major role, but how much of a role they will play I think is questionable at the moment, uh, Alec. There is the potential. They will play a major role, but only if they adopt a more flexible approach. Because one of the things that you know, we, we established from listening to the Committee on Climate Change at an ERP event recently, the pace has to quicken. The ambition for net zero is very aggressive. Um, flexibility, agility has to be at the centre in utilities to do that. And how important is the role of the regulator in that then? Obviously, uh, we're talking about uh, new regulatory cycles coming up, and um, you know, I think this week the, the plans will be announced um, uh, around the uh, Rio 2 uh, plans. Uh, how important is that flexibility, like you say, with things like decarbonisation and, and climate change and, and bringing that into those price controls to allow networks to achieve that? One could argue that the current regulatory uh, mechanism, particularly with the review periods, doesn't necessarily uh, support agility and, and a rapid movement. But the thing that I'm, the thing that I'm encouraged in the discussions that we've had uh, with with off German and Bayes is there is the wish and the will to address this without a doubt. And I think there is the realization that things have to change. And I think off Gem and Bayes are looking at this very seriously to realize that aspects of the current model are not going to lend themselves particularly for the aggressive targets that have been set or potentially been set at the moment. So I think regulation and government coordinated policy is essential to achieve those very important targets. And you touch upon uh, hydrogen and the, the role of hydrogen, obviously uh, there's some trials taking place um, uh, around uh, hydrogen and I think one of the, one of the key uh, things for hydrogen going forward from what I hear is that it's maybe got to be tested at a larger scale, um, would you agree with that? Yeah, absolutely. One of the, we're just about to um, uh, produce a, a report from the ERP on our view on, on hydrogen and projects like High Deploy and H21 really do set the the scene for learning to take us forward. And the ERP, the Energy Research Partnership, sees a significant, potentially a significant role for hydrogen in the future. The economics still need to be understood. Issues and challenges associated with large scale production, but it does lend itself very well to address a number of the issues. And of course it was highlighted in the Committee on Climate Change report has been one of the main areas where the net zero could be, could be achieved. So yes, we think it's going to play a significant role as long as the challenges are addressed. And as part of the Utility of the Future campaign, and specifically in Network Magazine, we'll be shining a light on the network of the future. Um, what do you think some of the main challenges are for the networks? For example, we've identified uh, uh, sort of uh, eight key trends, uh, including obviously decarbonisation of transport and heat, um, paying for the networks, for example, or some of those trends. Uh, but what do you think might be some of the key challenges for the networks going forward? Um, yeah in terms of delivering that network of the future? Yeah, well, the, well it, it depends. One of the things that really is going to challenge the networks of the future, and it's networks, gas, electricity, heat, hydrogen possibly. The challenge is going to be the coordination, the planning, the cross-sector cooperation to ensure resilience, the cross-sector cooperation to ensure economic solutions are provided to customers. Um, that would that will involve a significant change from the way we work at the moment. I think if we get that cooperation and understanding and we work towards an optimization, we're much more likely to, uh, to achieve our, our goals in the future. I think that's a significant challenge. And one of the other things I think is a significant challenge is consumer acceptance of whatever we have to do 
and whatever the networks will look like, whether they remain centralized or decentralized. One of the things about technology is it may be absolutely fantastic technology through our networks, through our energy services provision, but if customers don't accept it, it will not happen. And possibly one final uh, observation on networks is the coordination of network planning, energy network planning and provision with other services such as transport. Transport's gonna rely heavily, much, much more on a, on a coordinated energy system. And if the two don't work together, they will disrupt one another uh, negatively. Yeah, it's an interesting observation because historically they've really had no link, have they, transport and energy, but, but now clearly uh, with the whole EV agenda and decarbonisation of transport, other forms of transport, obviously hydrogen we've talked about, um, they, they now have to work together, as you say, don't they? They're, they're forced into that, uh, that approach. Absolutely. I mean, they can both help one another as well because, of course, we're looking at potentially vehicle-to-grid uh, technology as well as vehicles. And also, we, we're, we're hearing today about smart charging technology and also the provision of hydrogen. If we can provide hydrogen as an option through to heavy goods vehicles, as was potentially one of the recommendations in the net zero, and also for train transport and areas, there's a lot of help and balance that it can bring to the utilities to minimize the impact that the transport demand will place on the energy network. So it's an elephant in the room if it's not addressed properly and the, the two are brought together, they, they, they potentially could help one another considerably. Okay, well, thank you very much for your time today, Peter. Pleasure. And we look Absolute forward to pleasure. hearing more from you in your role on the uh, advisory board for our uh, Utility of the Future campaign going forward and your future contributions. But thank you for speaking to us today. Thanks, Sally. Thanks.